three years after this first foundation was set up, Johan Gustafsson decided to further increase his support to research within the field of natural sciences by setting up a second foundation, one that several distinguished scientists of this university has benefited from after selection by the Royal Academy of Science. We are most pleased to note that the support from the Johan Gustafsson Foundations also has increased significantly over the past three years. The field of medicine and medical research had always been one of the cornerstones of this university. And you may well say, perhaps even the foundation on which it stands today. Dating back to early scholars such as uh, Olof Rydbeck, Niels Rosén of Rosenstein, and Anders Celsius, uh, Carl Linnaeus, and more recent Nobel laureates Robert Barney and Alva Gullstrand. Today, Uppsala University, within the disciplinary domain of medicine and pharmacy, offers 21 complete program training future uh, physicians, nurses, biomedical analysts, pharmacists, and many other vocational categories, co uh, covering 12 institutions with a total of 6,600 students, 1,300 staff, and more than 200 professors. Examples of areas of strength are drug development, neuroscience, infectious diseases, resistance to antibiotics, cancer, diabetics, genomics. The Uppsala University Hospital, where we meet today, ha also has no less than four European Center of Excellence, neurotrauma, endocrine tumors, type 1 diabetes, and inflammation. Let me also mention one of the newest initiatives of the university, fully inspired by Dr. Landers' founding of the Broad Institute, the SciLife Lab, in cooperation with Stockholm University, the Karolinska Institute, the Royal Institute of Technology. A special mention here to Professor Shastin Lindblad, too, is in order. Shastin is the Director of Science for Li uh, Life Laboratory in Uppsala, and also the Scientific Director of Vertebrate Genome Biology at Broad Institute. Shastin has, of course, been an instrumental person in setting up the promising world-class center here in Sweden. It has been said by one of my predecessors, Dr. Martin Hauson Holmdahl, himself a distinguished professor in anesthesiology, there are three sorts of researchers in medicine at Uppsala. The ones who are on the way to postdoc in the States. The ones that are currently doing a postdocs in the United States. And the ones that have just have returned of their postdoc study or research tour in the Uni United States. Our contacts in the medical fields with the United States are thus extremely well developed, and we are of course thrilled to have uh, one of the world's leading American biologists, Professor Lander, here as this year's Johan Gustafsson speaker. On the behalf of Uppsala University, I am most grateful for all the support by the Johan Gustafsson Foundation in the past, and I'm looking forward to continued world-class academic excellence made possible by the foundation at this university. Now I'd like to hand over to Shastin Lindblom too for introduction of our lecture. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Eric Lander. He's the director of Broad Institute and also the pro a professor at MIT and at Harvard. Um, so a little more detail than that, Eric grew up in Brooklyn, New York. He was a math kid whiz early on, um, which shows by him 
being part of the US mathematical Olympic team in 1974, but he also used his skills for other things by both organizing and teaching um, other kids math, as I understand. Um, he went to college at Princeton University in the US and did a PhD in Oxford, England. Both of these were in the topics of mathematics. Then Eric started as a professor at Harvard Business School where he was teaching math and economics. I think after some time he find, found it boring and perhaps a little dry. And uh, he turned instead to explore biology and medicine. He started this endeavor by talking to David Botstein who and both of them together spent a lot of time thinking about how you could use analytical tools or what analytical tools needed to be developed to map and understand the human and mouse genomes and to map traits, for example. I think this really meant that Eric got ho hooked on biomedical research and he became a fellow at the Whitehead Institute where he continued to think about these things. In 1990. In 1990, Eric became the director of the Whitehead MIT Genome Sequencing Center, which soon emerged as a major leader in the Human Genome Project. Uh, the MIT Genome Center was the biggest producer of data as part of the Human Genome Project, and they were also, to a very large degree, thought leaders developing technologies to make sequencing cheaper, making the project a short one, or maybe not so short, but shorter than it would have been otherwise, I think. After the human genome was complete, Eric has continued to push the boundaries of human genomics to understand the human genome, to find the variation and to be able to genotype SNPs and other things, to learn about evolution, to find disease genes and to try to crack how to cure cancer. Not easy, but we're making great progress. And I believe he will talk about a lot of these things in his talk today, the way that we've been on. What I also really appreciate about Eric is that he's an altruistic leader aiming to t take on both the hardest challenges but also to develop the basic tools and resources for the world to use, to teach other people how to use them and also on top of this to perform novel discoveries to help both medicine and biology and biological understanding. Uh, to be able to address biomedical challenges in a comprehensive way Eric, in 2003, became the founding director of the Broad Institute, um, having spent, I think, a couple of years um, making both MIT and Harvard come together for the first time in a formal big research agreement. And, of course, he also um, was found, or maybe found, Eli and Edith Broad, who so, who so generously um, donated to the foundation of the Broad Institute, and who are also continuously big advisors and contributors. The Broad, I think, now has now close to 2,000 people in its community. It's very uh, cross-disciplinary, and I believe it both empowers truly pioneering and interdisciplinary science. Eric has published more than 400 papers and has received numerous awards and recognitions. Many of these have been for scientific achievements and discoveries. Still, other awards have highlighted his teaching skills and ability to reach out in society. One example is the uh, award from the American Academy of Sciences for Public Understanding of Science and Technology in 2004. Also in 2004, he was voted to be among the t 100 most influential people in the world today by the Time magazine. And he's also been voted one of the top 10 scientists in the world 10 years in a row, at least, I think. Maybe against this, it was not so surprising that in 2008 he was asked to co-chair the President Council of Science and Technology by President Obama. And the PCAST has worked on many different things, such as looking for at H1N1 influenza preparation, STEM education at the K-12 through level, so in integrating science, technology, and engineering in the school system in the United States, working on nanotechnology, health information technology, energy policy and biodiversity. So I think it really shows Eric's understanding of a great many regions of science. Um, I think along, along these lines it wasn't surprising that when there was a 10 year anniversary of the publication of the human genome, Eric was asked by nature to reflect on the past achievements and future potentials related to the human genome sequence. And I think today we look forward to hearing Eric discuss some of these things here. Thank you, welcome.
that's really what got me interested in the first place. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that today. Mostly we talk about what we have learned over the course of the few years since the completion of the grant sequence of the human genome. Um, tenure is a very short term. And that's been a lot of what's happened in ten years. And I'm so excited to see so many young students here. Who's in the back? Yes. Am I about? Can you hear me better? Oh, I'm sorry. Should I go back to the beginning? <laughs> I hope not. Good. Um, so look, this 10 years of genomics has been a remarkable lesson for those of us in the field, but I think it's particularly important for so many of the young people here for whom when you come into a field and you learn where it's at, you can, to use mathematical terms, pretty well get a point estimate of where we are, but it's hard to measure the derivative, the speed with which the field changes. And I want to give you a sense of what has gone on in the past 10 years, mostly because that derivative is increasing, and it will project forward to what will be going on in the next 10 years, which is the 10 years that so many of you, the young students here, will be driving this field. So that's my goal today. So, in order to talk about what has gone on, let me just briefly remind us there was this human genome project starting in the mid-1980s. People began to think about the crazy idea that we could sequence the whole human genome. It was indeed certifiably insane at the time because it would have required increasing the production of sequence by 100,000 fold or so, which was a lot. Uh, we had to invent all sorts of new methods and analysis, and people, you know, were wringing their hands about how hard it would be. But the biological community came together and said, let's make a plan and let's figure out how to get it done. And the plan was to work progressively, to build first genetic maps, scaffolds across the human genome with, with signposts that could be detected by genetic linkage then to fill that in with physical DNA, with physical clones, what we call a physical map, then a sequence map, and then to annotate the sequence map with the genes across the genome, and very importantly, to ensure that all of that information and all of those tools were absolutely freely available to anybody without restriction, whether they were in developed countries or developing countries, in academia or in industry. Anyway, that's all I'm gonna say about the doing of the human genome other than it got done. Uh, there it got, it got, the human genome got completed. Indeed, it got completed multiple times. We celebrated the completion of the human genome at least four separate times, I think. Um, we liked a good party. Um, you know, there was, there was a public celebration in June of 2000 about the claim that there was a rough draft sequence um, that was good enough for the White House and for 10 Downing Street to, to have a celebration. But of course, there was no scientific paper at the time. And, you know, I'm an old-fashioned kind of person. I think the real anniversary is the publication of the paper in 2001 uh, of a rough draft sequence. But that was still just a rough draft sequence. It still had only about 90% of the genome, and it had about 200,000 gaps and errors. And the International Consortium continued on for the next two years to produce a finished sequence of the human genome. And a finished sequence of the genome is not actually finished. Nothing we ever do is finished. It still had 300 gaps in it, but 300 is a pretty small number in there. The centromeres and telomeres and a few weird regions and things. But I always feel obliged to say it still isn't perfect even today. But it's good enough for almost all that we need to do. So in any case, that was the Human Genome Project. Now, I think there, was, there were at least some people who were hoping that when this Human Genome Project was done, we could get back to business as usual. It didn't turn out that way. It turned out that there were some fundamental things that had emerged from having a complete sequence of the human genome that changed the way we think about things and changed the way we did science. And really, there were two concepts that began to embed themselves, maps, and catalogs, maps. The idea that once we had a map of the sequence, we could on top of it layer more and more layers of mapping information, 
Just like Google Maps, for example, on, on an iPhone, you have many layers of information. You've got the basic information, but you also have the traffic patterns and the pizzerias and other things like that layered on top. And indeed, what we have seen over the past decade is a tremendous building of maps. From that initial genetic, physical, and, and sequence map, maps of genes, maps of evolutionary conservation across species, maps of chromatin states, maps of 3D folding, from the point of view of medicine, maps of inherited variation, of disease association, of evolutionary selection, of cancer genes, and many, many, many more kinds of maps. Because any kind of fragmentary information gathered by any method can be layered on top of this to build more maps. And that was what was so important about this information being utterly freely available, because it means all those maps are interoperable with each other. In addition, the concept of comprehensive catalogs changed the way we could do science because it meant that if we knew the whole sequence and we saw a short stretch of nucleotides, we could tell that that was uniquely in the human genome from one particular location. That meant we could build things like gene detectors with DNA sequences on those detectors because there was only one possible thing it could detect because we could check the complete sequence. Same thing for mass spectrometry. If we saw a particular amino acid sequence in a mass spectrometer and we could look up and say there are no other proteins that have that sequence, then we would know when we see that that signature was a sufficient description to know that that protein had been spotted. That only happens with completeness, that one can use signatures in that way. So maps and signatures have become a staple of all that we do in biology now. In addition, the other striking thing over these 10 years, I should say right away, is this technology for sequencing the genome that we were so proud of. We managed to sequence, you know, we were so proud, 1999, our center sequenced a billion bases. Well, what we have seen happen in sequencing technology is nothing less than stunning. This is a graph on a log scale here, factors of 10 going down, of the cost of DNA sequencing. And in that decade or so, a little more, probably calculated about 11 or 12 years or so, the cost of sequencing has fallen by give or take about one million fold. I don't know how many things you know of that have ever become a million times cheaper in the course of a decade. If you know, if houses were a million times cheaper, you know, think about the implications for that. Uh, even computers do not decrease in cost by anything like that. This is running three times faster than Moore's Law, the famous Moore's Law of computers. So for all of these reasons, uh, it's been an amazing decade. Where are we going with all this? Well, it's clear that if sequencing is becoming a million times cheaper, anything you can do by sequencing, you should do by sequencing. So everybody is trying to think of a way to convert any other problem they're working on into a sequencing problem because then it's cheap. Um, but it, that's uh, you know, it's a smart thing to do. If you want to measure a protein interaction, Wolf will tell you, let me figure out how to turn it into a DNA sequencing problem. If I want to measure something else, let me figure out how to turn it into a DNA sequencing problem. If I want to you know, study something, let me first get all the population data on it or a comparative data on it. And of course, this is going to roll out into medicine in all sorts of ways. Now, I want to be careful. It doesn't solve all problems. The fact that it will get used in medicine, it's not going to solve all medical problems. It will simply become affordable enough that we're going to want to gather that information. The sophistication is figuring out how to use that information. And we're going to want to talk about that. So anyway, that's kind of a very brief sort of look at what's happened in an amazing 10-year period. But I want to talk about what have we learned. Well, I've already told you what have we learned about genome sequencing. Well, we've learned how to do it a million times faster. That's a million times cheaper. That's good. But what have we learned scientifically? What have we learned about the functional elements encoded in this genome? What, what is the contents of the human genome? What have we learned about the evolution of the genome? about the basis of inherited diseases, about the basis of cancer, about human history. That's what I want to talk about in today's lecture. So, understanding the genome. Well, as good scholars, if we want to understand what we've learned about the human genome, we have to start by knowing what did we know before. So what did we know in 2001, around the time of the draft sequence of the human genome? Here were the facts then. Then we can talk about what we've learned since then. 
what was clear was that the number of protein coding genes in the human genome was somewhere between 35,000 and about 120,000. There was an argument about where in that range it was. Uh, we knew that there was important regulatory information sitting typically in front of a gene that controlled when it was turned on and off and scattered in some other places, but it was a minority of the information. Most of the information in the human genome that mattered was the protein coding sequences with some regulatory information. We did know a few genes that encoded not proteins. They just made RNAs that were never translated into proteins. There were a few classical classes, five or six classical classes, and about seven or eight weird exceptions. And we also knew that half of the entire human genome was junk. It was transposons, parasitic sequences that, that had hopped around the genome and were a burden on your DNA. That's what we knew. What have we learned now on top of that over the past decade? Well, what we've learned is that everything I just told you is wrong. That's called progress. None of those statements turn out to be correct. Um, how do we know that? Well, the first information came from evolutionary comparison. As we began to get the sequence of the human genome, we realized we didn't know how to read a sequence of the human genome. We needed to have a Rosetta Stone to compare it to. And the first Rosetta Stone was the mouse. You could take the mouse genome, which we got in 2000, late 2002, line it up against the human genome, look for similar segments, look for what was conserved evolutionarily. That began to be sufficiently productive that we wanted to have the rat and the dog genome. And that was sufficiently productive that we, and we is here always the scientific community, uh, you know, our lab contributed to this, and this was the, the many, many labs contributing to this, to getting lots and lots of vertebrate genomes, 24 mammalian genomes, and Shashtin and, 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 and I and others worked on collecting these, these 24 mammalian genomes and other vertebrate genomes. As you begin to line them up, you see all sorts of things. You can see, for example, that the number of genes in the human genome, which have been officially in the textbooks stated to be about 100,000. Indeed, I confess, I teach freshman biology at MIT, and I told a decade's worth of freshmen that there were 100,000 genes in the human genome. I'm still writing notes to them saying, you know, trying to correct that. Um, it's just not true. It, it turns out that when you start lining up evolutionarily, you can see what a conserved protein region is because it does not have mutations, it doesn't have deletions that are not multiples of three very often. Uh, it has a number of other such properties and there's some extremely good statistics that you can run to find those things that are protein coding. And I could give you a much longer description of why this is right and you could say, how do we know a whole bunch of protein coding genes weren't invented last week or you know, in the last million years? And I can tell you why that isn't true either. You have to measure some rates and things. But take my word, or else read the paper, that there's about 21,000 protein-coding genes in the human genome, somewhere between 21 and 22,000. And, you know, every, people discover a, a 10 here and 15 there, you know, but it's, it's not going up by very much. Um, that's the number of protein-coding genes in the human genome, much less than we ever thought. At the same time, the amount of evolutionarily conserved sequence in the human genome is much more than we thought. Turns out that the evolutionarily well-conserved sequence across mammals is about 6% of the nucleotides of the human genome, yet the protein coding sequences are only about 1.2%. The majority of what evolution has bothered to conserve carefully is not protein coding. Now, initially we could figure that out mathematically by indirect methods, by looking at the tail of the distribution and seeing it was too fat, but we couldn't actually put our finger on all of those conserved sequences. Now, with 29 mammalian genomes, we can go from be being able to identify only about 500,000 of them to being able to identify with this recent work in the past year or so, about 3 million of these elements, the vast majority of which we believe to be regulatory elements across the human genome, although there are other things as well. Tremendous amount of regulation across the genome. They could ask, let's take the most extremely conserved non-coding sequences. Where are they in the genome? And you can map them, and you can find that, in fact, I'm showing them in yellow, the density of these highly conserved non-coding sequences is not correlated with the density of protein coding genes. In fact, they tend to occur in regions that are very poor in protein coding genes. Not absent, just poor. In fact, they occur in regions 
that typically have a single protein coding gene involved in early development. It turns out that in early development, here's a typical such case, there's a gene protein coding sequence here shown in red, and all of this presumptive, highly conserved regulatory sequence around it shown in purple. It takes a lot of regulation to run an early developmental gene correctly. And our balance, at least my own balance, of how much protein coding versus regula regulatory control has changed very much in my mind about what's going on in the human genome. Now, you can ask, if that's the case, what is it that evolves when we make elephants and hippopotamuses and giraffes and horses and mice? Is it the protein coding sequences or is it the regulatory controls? And in fact, we have very good evidence it's the regulatory controls that are evolving much more rapidly. The um, way we can do that is by comparing to an outgroup like the marsupials. Marsupials diverged about 180 million years ago, whereas the placental mammals diverged about 90 million years ago. And we can ask what's common amongst the placentals but evolved after the, the marsupials diverged off. And you can look at all the sequences that were invented during that 90 million year period and you can classify them. And the vast majority of stuff invented in that period is not protein coding, it's this non-coding stuff. That tells you that evolution is working hardest on the regulatory sequences. Now it poses an interesting challenge to you. If I'm inventing new regulatory sequences to coordinately regulate, say, 20 genes across the genome, do I have to wait for each of the 20 genes to evolve a parallel regulator? Boy, that sounds like it's gonna take a long time to wait for the random evolution of coordinate regulation in 20 places. Of course, these days we understand with the internet, if you have a good idea, good ideas can go viral and spread broadly. Well, in fact, the internet didn't invent that. Going viral turns out, of course, to be a biological concept. And, in fact, that is how ideas spread across the human genome. It turns out a good way to spread an idea across the human genome is for a transposable element, a protovirus, to pick it up and randomly distribute it around the genome. Most places it's not going to do any good, but when it lands someplace where it does good, it can be retained by evolution. Well, in fact, when we look in the human genome, we see that at least 18%, and I think now the estimate's more like a quarter of all of the stuff that was invented in those 90 million years, we can tell was brought there by transposons. Because the signature of the transposon that brought it there is still present. And so these transposons that are indeed mostly junk, mostly a burden on our genome, are still doing something pretty darn useful. And we can't really call them parasites anymore. They are symbionts in our genome. They do, from time to time, the very useful work of spreading innovations across the genome. So anyway, these are some of the things we learn by looking at the human genome. Now we can learn other things. We can learn things by looking at the epigenome. So the genome is wrapped up around histones. The histones are modified with different post-translational modifications, methylations and acetylations. In addition, various proteins sit on top of the DNA, on top of the chromatin. And if we knew what proteins and what modifications were located where along the DNA, we could learn things. Well, now it's not so hard to do it. If the histones are modified or if proteins are sitting there and you have an antibody to any of those things, you can cross-link the DNA, use your antibody to pull down the protein of interest, and then sequence the DNA that came along with your protein and find out what DNA is attached to that protein and thereby, by laying those sequences onto the human genome, map the positions of your proteins. So if you're looking at the blue protein, you can f make a map of where the blue protein sits, the red protein, the green protein, etc. Well, I'll just focus on an example of it. There is a particular modification that marks the promoters of active genes. It's uh, lysine 4 trimethylation, green, at active promoters. And along the transcribed length of a protein coding gene, lysine 36 trimethylation. That's a nice signature of an actively transcribed protein coding gene. 
So we got these data from chromatin mapping of the human genome and saw that lots of the active genes, the active genes had this signature of a green and a blue. And this graduate student over there, Mitch Gutman, in his first week in the lab, we gave him the task of tidying up the human genome by saying, look in the human genome and see if you find any places with this green and blue signature which we haven't already identified as a protein coding gene and you'll have discovered a few new genes. So Mitch went away for two weeks and came back and he says, I found some. Good. I found about 2,000. So then you have the hypothesis. First year graduate student, hypothesis one, he's completely screwed up. Right? <laughs> Hypothesis two, he's made a really interesting discovery. The wise thing is first to investigate carefully Hypothesis one. We did, but we rejected Hypothesis one because he'd actually done a really careful analysis and he'd found more than 2,000 instances across the human genome when he ran through the genome with his computer code where he said known, known, new, 2,000 such instances, and it was real. These things just looked like the signature of protein coding genes, except they didn't encode any proteins. To make a long story short, what he found at the point where we did this was up to 3,500, I think the now the count's about 5,000, functional genes that make RNAs that do not encode proteins and function as RNAs. I remind you that we did know such things existed before. We knew seven examples before. Um, but it turns out it's very common. They show evolutionary conservation, although a different pattern of evolutionary conservation than proteins. Their promoters show conservation as well. Highly conserved, typical of protein coding genes. They show conservation of chromatin structure across species, etc. The few examples that were known included things like H19, for example, and a few other such things, each with a distinct function. So how were we going to attach function to all of these new genes that didn't encode proteins? Well, one way is guilt by association. If you take the gene expression patterns of protein coding genes across lots of tissues and get the gene expression patterns of these new non-coding RNAs, you can find which sets of genes are correlated with each of these non-coding RNAs. And in that way, you could attach meanings. You could say, these RNAs show very similar expression patterns to sets of genes involved in immune responses, brain processes, stem cell pluripotency, cell cycle regulation, etc. And you can make putative guesses as to what they likely do by correlation. Of course, correlation is limited. You know, because they show correlation with diverse biological processes, doesn't show that they actually carry out those biological processes. And I could tell you stories about how it could be an artifact of, of various things. Some little regulator sitting nearby doesn't really mean anything. So you have to actually then go in and knock out these things. Use RNAi to knock down these link these, these non-coding RNAs, we call them link RNAs. And I'm going to summarize a tremendous amount of work that Mitch Gutman has done during his graduate student work, and he's now starting his own lab at Caltech uh, starting next year because it's been beautiful work, and I'm just going to summarize it very, very briefly. But we took, we took about 200 of these things that are expressed in embryonic stem cells and knocked them down with RNAIs, and about 90% of these guys, when you knock them down, have clear functional effects um, on gene expression in the cell. 26 of them appear to be essential for maintaining pluripotency. About 30 of them are essential for repressing differentiation down particular lineages. When we look at the genes encoding these RNAs, they are indeed bound at their promoters by the critical pluripotency factors, um, OCT4 and NANOG and SOX2. When we knock down those pluripotency factors, it knocks down transcription of those genes. And when ES cells differentiate, these particular link RNAs, non-coding RNAs, are in fact downregulated. We've also looked at what proteins these link RNAs bind to. They bind to diverse proteins, many chromatin proteins. And our picture right now is that each link RNA binds to multiple proteins. Indeed, 
our best guess, and we're in the process of trying to prove this, is that the link RNA acts as a flexible scaffold for organizing a protein complex. It's actually, when you think about it, a very clever idea that, that life came up with. If I had to build lots of protein complexes by perfectly engineering their binding to each other, that would be hard. But if each can bind the link RNA, and then the link RNA, by virtue of its continuity, tethers that complex together, they can interact with much lower specificity requirements amongst the proteins. And then I just keep making new link RNAs and bring together whoever I want to to organize the party. And in fact, telomerase, it's a nice way to do it. Telomerase is known to work that way, to be a flexible scaffold. And we think perhaps many thousands of these link RNAs work in the same way as flexible scaffolds. So we're in the process now of mapping all the binding sites of all the link RNAs, which you can do in parallel, mapping which proteins bind to those things. We have a way to map where each of these things then goes down and sits in the human genome. None of that work is done, but we're hoping over the course of the next 12 months to have a pretty good catalog of all the binding sites, interactions, et cetera, et cetera. There are a whole new world of things that we never expected were in the human genome. All right, so um, this just, just to say there's a lot more to learn about the human genome. We need total catalogs of all the transcripts, all the long-range genomic interactions. I haven't talked to you about 3D structure. I could, but I won't. All the epigenomic modifications, all the interactions amongst proteins, DNA, and RNA. We can't rest until we have all of that information because it turns out there are many surprises still in the human genome. And we're still pretty crummy at figuring out how any of these elements works as a processor, how it integrates information. And we're only, by using the tools of synthetic biology, going to be able to do that. Because until we can write these things ourselves, we really don't understand them. All right. But now I want to turn to what was the justification for the Human Genome Project, and that was the study of disease. The goal for taking on a human genome project was to understand the basis of disease. We had in the 20th century no way to systematically, in an unbiased fashion, find the basis of a disease. You could be lucky, study a disease, and be insightful enough to figure out what's going on. But that's not a guarantee. One wanted something guaranteed. And here, Mendelian diseases were the first such example. David Botstein's key insight in a paper in 1980 that one could use recombinational mapping together with DNA sequence variation to map single, simple Mendelian disease traits. Well, that led to the mapping of the Huntington's disease gene and the cystic fibrosis gene, but it was incredibly painful to map genes in the 1980s. You could spend seven, eight, ten years the point of the human genome was to accelerate that, and it definitely did. By 2001, more than 1,300 simple Mendelian disease genes had been mapped. By earlier this year, it was about 3,200. I was just checking yesterday. I think it's about 3,500 now. In fact, something like uh, two-thirds of all Mendelian diseases have been mapped to specific genes already. Really quite an exciting thing. Lots more to go, but we're, it's clearly that's working. But of course, most of us have never heard of almost all of those rare Mendelian diseases. There are a few you've heard of, but most of them are exceedingly rare. What about the stuff that we all get, that we're going to, many of us, die of? Diabetes and Alzheimer's disease and, and you know, stroke and schizophrenia. Well, our ability to map those to specific genes was even worse. The number of common diseases for which we could pin important genetic variants down to them, well, in 1990, when the Human Genome Project was starting, roughly one, HLA, the HLA complex, could be connected to all sorts of things. But we didn't have many more. Even by the time the Human Genome Project was finishing, it was only about 25 examples, most prominent of which was the ApoE4 allele and Alzheimer's disease but very few, because there was no systematic way to do it. They were all lucky, accidental findings. But around the mid-1990s, several of us were excited by the idea that there might be systematic ways to do this. In fact, actually, I should always say speaking in Scandinavia, this really traced back to ideas from Finland, 
from work with Finnish genetics and collaborations with Albert de la Chapelle and uh, with Lena Peltonen, um, and recognizing that you could treat an entire population as if it was a family, if you had a dense enough map to look back into history and recognize the connections. And it was really Scandinavia that made that idea clear and where it first got, and, and what it did is it gave rise to this more general notion that you could collect all the common genetic variation in the human population. There'd only be a certain amount of it. It could be used to proxy for nearby genetic variation. And if you could merely test, oh, I don't know, a few million genetic variants across tens of thousands of people, you'd be able to find genes that were involved in common diseases. Now the problem was millions of genotypes by tens of thousands of people is tens of billions of genotypes to do. And uh, at the time, they were done one at a time. And the graduate students objected to doing tens of billions of assays, which is not unreasonable. Um, and of course, we didn't even have all these genetic variations. But it's important to have a theoretical method first and then I mean, the reason many of us worked on the Human Genome Project was we needed it as a tool to do what we knew theoretically we wanted to do. So it turned out that even though we didn't have very many genetic variations, we could get them. We started, we only had 4,000 then, but today we have 20 million of them. Uh, at the time, you had to study all of them, but we found out that they're locally correlated with each other in haplotype structures. And if we knew the haplotype structure, we could get away with only looking at a subset. And so, as a global project, we worked out the haplotype structure. And then it turned out that while we had a genotype one at a time, we then worked out how to do it 10 at a time, and 100 at a time, and 1,000 at a time, and a million at a time. And today, you could do 5 million at a time. And it's like amazing. So you put out an idea, and somehow, over the course of a decade, and this is really what I want the students to know, is you put out things that sound utterly insane. And they are utterly insane, except that 10 years later, they're just totally tractable. That is the way our field goes. That's what's so exciting about being in biology. And here's what it felt like. The number of common genetic variants associated with common diseases discovered in the year 2000 was one in diabetes. Two in 2001, one in 2002, one in 2003, one in 2004, and then these tools start coming along. And in 2005, we had four examples. In 2006, eight examples. In 2007, we had that. And today, I think it's actually up to over 2,000. I have to update the slide. Over 2,000 loci that have been correlated now with more than 225 different traits. And it's continuing to grow at a tremendous rate. And let me tell you some of the impact of this. Lipids. Mendelian studies had identified genes for lipids, lipid levels. A variety of genes that are important had been identified by Mendelian studies, but these kind of comprehensive studies, sometimes called genome-wide association studies, have identified, and this is the work of, say, Kath Riesen, more than 100 loci now, including essentially everything that was found by Mendelian genetics except for two examples have come up through these genome-wide association studies, but many, 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 many more. They're striking. Some of them have alleles in the human population that have very clear effects. They lower your LDL cholesterol by 16%. And they lower your risk of, of myocardial infarction by 40%. You make a mouse that has these knockouts, and it has the same effects in the mouse. Beautiful example is PCSK9, a common genetic variant present in about, there's a stop codon present in about 2% in the African-American population. And it lowers LDL cholesterol by about 50%. And uh, by about 21 mg per deciliter, and it lowers risk of heart disease by about 50%. And there's even one homozygote who's been found, and she's perfectly fine. So it turns out she has extremely low cholesterol, but it's a very nice thing if you were a drug maker, because you'd say, boy, I'm not going to have a lot of side effects by lowering this, this PCSK9 too much, because somebody's walking around without any copies of it at all. And multiple companies now have developed antibodies against this circulating protein and they dramatically lower LDL. Now, those are examples in a positive direction. But now let me tell you another thing you can do with this. That's LDL. What about HDL? Remember, LDL is the bad cholesterol. HDL is the good cholesterol. High LDL is associated with heart attack. High HDL is associated with protection from heart attack. 
So every drug company, well, most drug companies, said obviously high HDL is good epidemiologically, and therefore we should make drugs that increase your HDL. Now notice, just as a little, to be a stickler about this, the fact that high HDL is correlated epidemiologically does not mean that raising your HDL would cause you to have less heart attacks. Correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. But that's very fussy, you know. Um, and at least four drug companies spent several billion dollars each on the hypothesis that high HDL would actually, that raising your HDL would actually protect you. Interestingly, in the past two years, two of the clinical trials have come in and have been absolute utter failures. In fact, one of them increased your risk of heart attack, didn't offer protection. One of them had no effect at all. Why is that? Well, turns out we could investigate. A whole bunch of these genes for lipids affect your HDL levels by little bits. They affect, some affect your LDL, some affect your HDL. Well, what you can do is you can ask, do the genes that affect your LDL levels that are found in these GWAS studies, do they correlate with, protection, with, with risk of heart attack? LDL, they do. Then you can take the genes that are associated with HDL and ask, do they correlate with risk of heart attack? No correlation, just none. It could have saved you a couple billion bucks. Um, and this is where genetics can be very powerful because it's a Mendelian randomization. This is work of, say, Kathreesen and David Altshuler, where Mendel has already randomized the distribution of these HDL alleles across the population and has done a little bit of a clinical trial for you. And the clinical trial has come up negative, and it didn't cost very much to find this out. We need to be doing this a lot more. Now, there are many such examples. Inflammatory bowel disease. There's now more than 140 genes that have been found in inflammatory bowel disease. They fall into a variety of pathways. IL-23 receptor signaling, autophagy. Mice have gotten made that mimic these defects, etc. I'm particularly excited about schizophrenia. In schizophrenia, there were early studies with these genome-wide association studies that were absolutely, completely negative. Nothing was found. In fact, nothing was found to the extent that the National Institutes of Mental Health said we should stop funding such studies because we're not going to find anything. It's, of course, important to think about power calculations because then 20,000 samples were done and things were found. And then 34,000 samples were done and a lot more things were found. And the most recent stuff that has come out now has 62 genes, four of whom are the four subunits of an L-type calcium channel. I don't think that's an accident. I think it's saying that L-type calcium channel plays a significant role in the biology of schizophrenia. Five of them are, collect are connected to a particular microRNA, MIR-137. And one is beginning to see, like with saturation mutagenesis in Drosophila, pathways emerge when you have enough numbers to be able to do things. So anyway, I'm going to skip over details about this. I'm just going to skip through this and say that we aren't done by any means. We've still only explained a fraction of the genetic variation for each of these diseases. And partly that's a question of we don't have big enough sample sizes. Partly it's a question of the tools so far have only looked at alleles with frequency above 5 or 10%. There are now tools being used to get down to about 1%. And then full sequencing can get you down to rare alleles below a percent. And there's going to be a huge amount of discovery coming out over the next couple of years. I'll make an aside to the aficionados that there was, a, there was a little bit of a period when people were saying that the sequencing was going to quickly show us zillions of these rare things. That actually is not happening yet. It looks like there are not huge numbers of these highly powerful rare things. They also will be a slog. They will take tens of thousands of samples to, to be able to get, but that's okay. We're going to be able to get those things. And I think we're going to see a biology laid out for these things. Now, all right. That's inherited disease. What about cancer? Same story for cancer. For cancer, except that it's somatic changes. Now, cancer is a beautiful example. Uh, it's also a beautiful example of, of, of common wisdom. You know, as early as 1914, Bouveri proposed that chromosomal changes cause cancer. 
But by 1970, the viral notion of cancer was so well established that someone could write in a review, the viral origin of the majority of malignant tumors is now documented beyond any reasonable doubt. Whenever anybody uses legal language like that, you should, you should worry. Um, because, of course, that's just before we got oncogenes and, and we realized that cancer really was a disease of the genome. Um, and by 1986, there were examples with RAS and ABL and MYC and retinoblastoma gene. Uh, but each was just scattered examples. And Renato Dulbeco wrote a famous editorial in Science Magazine saying, if we're ever going to take on cancer seriously, we need the whole sequence of the human genome. And one of the motivations for the sequence of the human genome was this call to have the tools to be able to take on cancer. So when the human genome got done, a bunch of us got together on a working group for the National Cancer Institute. I co-chaired this with Lee Hartwell and a bunch of people, Harold Varmus and others were on this thing, and called for a kind of human cancer genome project that would systematically analyze lots and lots and lots of tumors. And to make a long story short, the thing got launched under the heading of the Cancer Genome Atlas. There's also now a great international collaboration involving 17 countries, the International Cancer Genome Consortium, to sequence tumors, compare it to blood, and collect the mutations and analyze. I'll just give you one example of it. In multiple myeloma, uh, an important blood cancer, before systematic genome analysis, there were three genes known to be consistent, mutated in many multiple myelomas, KRAS, NRAS, and P53. On sequencing large numbers of multiple myeloma, Lots of pathways dropped right out of the sky. Um, yes, the known mutations, but 40% of all multiple myeloma samples had mutations in, path, in a, 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 a couple of genes having to do with protein homeostasis. 25% in the NF-kappa B pathway. 10% in a particular differentiation pathway. 4% had BRAF mutations, very relevant because there are BRAF inhibitors. 16% had mutations affecting the thrombin pathway. Thrombin is mitogenic, et cetera, et cetera. We're just getting there. There's, there's now, at our place, we've sequenced more than 5,000 tumor normal pairs. I think around the world, there's about 10,000 that have been sequenced. They vary in their rates of mutations, their patterns of mutations. But to summarize a tremendous amount of work going on in many places, uh, this Human Cancer Genome Project, when it was started, some people said, we don't need this. We already know the mutations that cause cancer. We know the genes that are important in cancer. That was one view. Another, people's, another view was, we're never going to be able to sort it out. It's too complicated. In fact, it's turned out we didn't know everything, and it's not impossible to at least sort out some of it. What's emerged is, yes, we knew about protein and lipid kinases, but since then, through genomics, we've come to know about lineage survival genes, transcription factors that are lineage-specific, genes involved in protein synthesis, protein homeostasis, chromatin regulators, a big, big, big important class, metabolic enzymes, RNA splicing factors, squamous cell differentiation, oxidative stress, etc., have all emerged from systematic genomic looking. We need to be able to create comprehensive roadmaps here. So, um, whoops, I'm going to skip over that and simply say we need to collect a ton of information. In fact, we need to begin to do this in the clinic. We need to do this in the clinic in the big way. Somehow, over the course of the next several years, sort of needs to become the standard of care that genomic information is collected and used, but that's not enough. It has to somehow be aggregated across the world. I'm very mindful of the privacy issues. We have to respect patient privacy. We have to respect consent issues. That said, there will be patients who have miraculous responses in Uppsala, and you'll have one such patient and you won't be able to tell what it was about their genome that accounted for it. But there will be a patient in Saskatchewan and in Durban, South Africa, and in Tokyo who show that same response. And if you could put that together by aggregating data, you could quickly know why it was, what was in common, intersect those four genomes. If you have to wait to write up a case report from that patient here and scan the literature for a case report from Durban, South Africa, and put together those pieces, we will take 25 years more to solve cancer than if we can figure out a way to aggregate data. I believe it's possible. I believe we've got to move toward a regime where we can store data in interoperable ways. It doesn't mean there's one great database in the sky which holds everybody's data. 
you know, Sweden might decide Swedish data should live in Sweden, that's fine. It's about the ability to do it in completely compatible ways, the ability to have a privacy bit that you could flip and say, I'm not sharing right now, but I might share later. Or you can compute against it and send me a note that I have a patient who's sort of similar. But uh, there are many ways we can do it, but we must have a commitment that we are going to share data, because I can't imagine telling patients why we're moving more slowly, because we haven't figured out how to share data. So in any case, we've seen enough to let us know how powerful this is going to be, but we've only just begun to share in this way. Finally, last, we're learning a lot of fun stuff about human evolution. There's so much just plain fun stuff in the human genome. Uh, the view from 2000 when we were finishing up the human genome was a pretty simple view. I taught my students that humans emerged from Africa, went out and split and split and split. And oh yeah, there's this thing called selection. Um, and evolution acts on humans too. And the example we could always cite was malaria, which acted on a bunch of genes. And that was the example we could cite again and again because we didn't actually have any other examples. What's been wonderful over the last decade is we now, these stories have become so much richer. It isn't just migration and splitting out of Africa. It's migration and mixing. There's been mixing of different human populations. India, it's now clear, was a mixture of two populations coming together. The most dramatic and exciting mixture was that on the way out of Africa, we mixed with Neanderthal, as Svante Pebo has shown. That there has been about 4% of the human genome, maybe 3% of the human genome, that, that comes from mixture with Neanderthal. And we can begin to document all of these mixtures by looking at these maps of genetic markers and whole segments that were introduced. With regard to positive selection, well, JBS Haldane taught us about malaria and positive selection with sickle cell and such. That's a correlation of the distribution of malaria and the distribution of sickle cell. Uh, you know, he could figure that out. But he had to know first what trait he was looking for. A former postdoctoral fellow of mine, Pardis Sabeti, He's developed some beautiful ways where you don't need to know the trait. You can just look for a screaming signature in the human genome of a chunk of genome that has been held, to, that, that, that is present as a long haplotype. Long haplotypes shouldn't exist unless something has been selected very rapidly and brought with it all its neighbors because there hasn't been enough time for genetic recombination to scramble them. That's a screaming signature of positive selection is a long haplotype, much longer than it should otherwise be, that's at high frequency. It can only get to high frequency and still be long if it got there rapidly. And that's positive selection. And so more than 300 regions have been identified in the human genome that are positive selection in the last five, 6,000 years. Some of them, you know, you can refine them down and they have to do with pigmentation. There's a pigmentation gene there, but many of them have to do with infectious disease resistance. It's clear those genes are involved in infectious disease resistance, some in skin color, some in homeostasis, metabolism, immune responses. We're seeing the signatures in the human genome, just in the distribution of polymorphism across the genome, the signatures of the forces that have acted on our species. All right, so what have we learned about the human genome? Well, over the last decade, a lot about genome sequencing. A lot about the functional elements in the genome, the evolution of the genome, the basis of inherited disease, of cancer, of human history. We've also learned a lot about how to study biology. We've learned a lot that collecting large amounts of data, what I guess is trendy in computer science worlds to call big data, can be incredibly powerful. Big data sets make it possible for bright young students to find all sorts of things there that they could never produce at their own bench. To do an experiment at their own bench and then look at it through the lens of massive amounts of data and see something in their experiment that they could never see without all those data. And we've learned that we can only do that by sharing. We can only do that by working together in common projects to produce those data, make them freely available. That was, again, a, th a big theme around the Human Genome Project was, was this going to be a common public good or would it be a private good? And it was an important discussion, and I think the answer is very clear. These things must be public goods. So we've learned a lot about how to do it. We've also learned that we've only scratched the surface of what's in the genome, only scratched the surface of the basis of medicine. But boy, the yield is going up and up and up. So if the students get a sense of what the slope has been over the past decade, imagine that rate and imagine what the next 10 years look like.
Now, I've talked about a lot of things. I've talked about things from many of my colleagues at the Broad. I want to particularly acknowledge uh, in the genome sequencing efforts and my good colleague, Shashtin lindblad Toh, who has been driving mammalian genomics and vertebrate genomics at, at, at uh, the Broad while also being here in Uppsala, uh, being in, in two different continents at the same time is, is a, quite a challenging thing to do and, and has led an entire group doing cross-species and evolutionary analysis of all these things. My colleagues at the Broad who work on population genetics, cancer genomics, these link RNAs, positive selection. And then there's no way to really talk about genomics with a real acknowledgement slide, which is this is, this is an effort of many people in the world. Um, you know, no, no one group, no one lab, no one country could possibly do these things, but by working together, it's really quite remarkable what we, what we can do. It is a pleasure to be here in Uppsala. Again, congratulations on what you're doing to really take advantage of the power of genomics, to organize in new ways, to build bridges with Stockholm, and uh, thank you for the honor of giving this named lecture. Thank you very much. I don't know what the tradition is, but I'm glad uh, some people may have to leave, but anybody wants to stay and ask any questions, I'm open for questions. Don't be shy. Okay, good. But please shout. In pseudogenes, what, what would you like to know about pseudogenes? Right. Well, in fact, when we thought there were... Okay, I'm going to give you the truth, all right? Don't tell anybody. Um, you see, the, the thing was there were supposed to be 100,000 genes in the genome. The reason we thought it was 100,000 genes in the genome, this goes back to Wally Gilbert, was a typical gene was about 30,000 bases, and the genome was about 3 billion bases. And you divide one into the other, you get 100,000. That was roughly what the, what the reason was. Then, when we actually sequenced the human genome, when we analyzed it, and we were writing the paper, we didn't see 100,000 genes, and we were really bothered by this, because there were supposed to be 100,000 genes. In fact, we couldn't see more than 30,000 genes in the human genome. We wrote in the paper in 2001 that there were 30 to 40,000 genes in the genome because we felt really insecure that our number was too low. And we covered ourselves by saying 30 to 40,000 probably. And we, went, we were wrong in the wrong direction. Um, in fact, what we were doing is we were calling pseudogenes. It turns out there's a lot of pseudogenes all over the genome. And until your genome sequence is very high quality, you can't tell them from working genes. So transposons have been distributing pseudogenes, and RNAs have been distributing, uh, RNAs reverse transcribed have been distributing pseudogenes. So there's actually a ton of pseudogenes, and most of what we thought were genes are really pseudogenes. Lots of them. Great. It's a great question, and, and I can admit now that we fixed it, that we were like way off on the gene count because of, of our inability to distinguish pseudogenes. Yes? Ah, the ENCODE project and the claim that 80% of the genome is functional. You have to understand what that statement means. If I have a gene that is transcribed and it's got a few, a few exons and a lot of introns, all of the introns are functional because they belong to the category intron. They count. The way the 80% number comes is 80% of the genome has an annotation, like is transcribed but could be thrown out. I have no problem with that number. I don't think it's a very useful number, but it's a fine number as long as you make that definition that that's what you're going to count. So 
if you read the paper closely, they're absolutely correct that 80% of the genome can have something said about it. The newspapers, however, interpret that as 80% of the genome is functional. Now, that's a very different claim. In the, in the ENCODE consortium, where the Broad is one of the largest contributors to the ENCODE consortium, Brad Bernstein, my good colleague on the sixth floor of the Broad, is you know, very much involved in that. And, and Brad and I have talked at great length. That particular statement has been taken so wildly out of context in the press to mean that the genome is functional at 80% of its bases, and there's no evidence for that. Currently, the most exciting debates are between my number of about 6.5% and some of my colleagues who believe that should be 9.5%. Okay? And there's some good evidence that they might be right, and I'm willing to concede that the 6.5 could be 9.5. I know no evidence greater than 9.5 of functional in the sense that I wish to mean it, namely that the sequence matters, rather than that there's just sequence there over which something happens. This is always the problem. You've got to read the fine print on, on claims. It's a great question you're asking. I don't disagree with the paper, because deep down, the sentence is actually technically correct. It's just almost universally misunderstood. Yes, please. Loud. Oh, the connectome, yeah. Yeah, ohms everywhere. Look, you, it's easy to state big projects, and not all of them are good, right? I mean, no, 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 no. It's, it's very easy to say, I want to do every, collect everything of every sort. You've got to ask, do you have tools to do it efficiently? By starting it, are you going to get better and better and better and drive down the cost? Can you interpret it? And some of these projects have been tremendously powerful in that way. I like projects like that. But I also am a hard-nosed consumer of those projects because I see 10 times as many proposals of them as should get done. So it depends on which ones you're talking about. Um, I don't know enough about the connectome proposals to really evaluate technically, but I've seen some pretty cool stuff. It still seems many orders of magnitude off where we want to be, but if you can do the right kind of tracing and, and you can do it with enough throughput, sectioning and reconstruction, whatever, could be pretty cool. I bet there are a lot of surprises. You just got to see your way for getting cheap. The first human genome costing three billion bucks is okay. Now that the human genomes are down to about six thousand bucks, you know, we got some return on it. To me, it's it's like the difference between going to the moon, where we went a few times to prove we could get to the moon, but we don't go to the moon a lot. Whereas we got to the genome. And we go back every day to the genome because we figured out how to do it really efficiently. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe soon enough we'll get to the moon every week and I'll be wrong on that. No, it's, it's entirely possible. But that's really the test of these projects is do they get you over some activation barrier and then lower that barrier so you can do this routinely um, rather than one great project to go to the moon. And it's a matter of taste. And you've got to have young people who deeply believe in it. What was great about the human genome was, was lots of the older folks hated the idea, and therefore younger people liked the idea, and therefore younger people stayed up late working hard on the idea, and that's what makes progress in this world. So my advice to you is don't listen to what anybody older than 40 is saying. <laughs> and do it. All right, yes, other questions? Over there, shout loud. I, rec I, I recommend exercise. Um, <laughs> no, I, I lost like 35 pounds exercising. It feels really good. Um, and I did it without sequencing my genome. I have not sequenced my genome. I, I, I actually don't joke because there are companies that will sequence your genome and, tell, and recommend personalized plans and all sorts of stuff. We don't know enough to do that. And yet I can recommend that almost all of you should exercise, right? And you don't. And having your genomes... <laughs> And having your genome sequence, it's not obvious to me why that's going to make you exercise when you know. 
anyway. And I can also advise you all not to smoke. Um, and I don't need your genome sequence. In other words, there are a whole lot of public health measures that make obvious sense for which we don't need your genome and would have huge impacts. And we've got to figure out why we're doing so poorly at getting all of those things across because you know, I love high-end fancy science, but we've got to also say there's a lot of pretty straightforward low-end science, or at least now low-end science, that we can't implement. We've got to figure it out. Now, that said, I'm a huge believer in personalized medicine done properly. Cancer, there is no doubt that it is crazy to think about treating a breast cancer, a lung cancer. It's just, it's just malpractice to treat a lung cancer rather than an EGFR positive lung cancer or an ALK translocation positive lung cancer. Um, I do believe that we're going to treat cancers based on what's actually wrong there. There was a time that diabetes was diabetes before there was type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. You know, there's nothing so shocking that, you know, nosology, breaking down diseases into their proper categories, has been, the great, has been a great power of medicine. You've got to recognize a diagnostic category, got to, got to bound it correctly to match with a molecular mechanism. And if what personalized medicine means is a more powerful way to attach diagnostic categories to molecular mechanisms, we better be doing a lot of it. Now, on the other hand, if personalized medicine means we're going to be making a special drug just for you, I don't think so. Not when drugs cost a billion dollars to make. So I think personalized medicine is about getting the categories of, of medicine right. And that will be incredibly powerful. But again, there's a lot of hype out there around these sort of things. And I am anti-hype. You know, I've been anti-hype that the human genome is going to cure everything and solve everything very quickly. I do think in the long run it's an incredibly powerful tool. Um, I'm anti-hype that the genome is going to automatically get you good health, as I've seen claims in, in places and all that. Um, so it's a question of just understanding what things are good for. I think genome's incredibly powerful, but it's only as powerful as what it's good for, and we've got to make sure that people limit it to, to, to that. So it's a great question, and we all have to, you know, anybody involved in medicine in any way has to make sure that we make realistic promises about what we're going to deliver. On the other hand, realistic promises turn out to be incredibly powerful given several decades. Yes? So I think sensitivity to a virus will clearly be like for diabetes or schizophrenia or whatever, have multiple genes involved, and I think they're very mappable. And I think we need to understand what those factors are that make some people more susceptible. I also think that understanding the pathogen genomes is every bit as important as understanding the human genome. And I didn't talk anything about it, but I think they're incredibly powerful things that have to be done. I look at a case like tuberculosis. Two billion people in the world infected with tuberculosis. And yet the genomics of tuberculosis has not been well done. It's a hard organism to work with. Smart young people don't work on tuberculosis because it grows 20 or 40 times slower than E. coli. And so why would a young person want to work on it? Um, well, no, no, it's really hard to, to you know, make that fit in your career. We need to produce genomic tools like knockouts of every gene. I mean, if you want to knock out a gene in tuberculosis, it's a four or five month affair to knock out a gene. If we expect each young investigator to knock out their genes themselves, as opposed to producing great genomic reagents that allow uh, tuberculosis research to go 10 times faster, shame on us. So I think we've got to look at each of these infectious diseases and make sure that we have the tools out there to attract really smart young people because they're incredibly important, especially in, in, in uh, much of the developing world. So I'm a huge fan of infectious disease genomics and didn't talk anything about it other than that brief comment at the end, only for, for lack of time, and I don't myself work that much on it. But I think there's transforming things to be done there. Yep. Of course. So um, 
environment is obviously incredibly important in all of these things. We know that the rates, for example, of type 2 diabetes in Asia are skyrocketing. We know that they used to be quite low, type 2 diabetes and heart disease, and now there are epidemics, and the genes have not changed in Asia. It's entirely environment that has changed. Um, we know this with regard to many, many things. So we always have to tell people that because something has a genetic foundation, does not mean that environment is not necessarily incredibly important and might be the right point of intervention. Even though we're finding the genetics of it, environmental intervention might be the right thing. Now, how does environment work? Does it work by setting stable epigenetic states? Does it work by setting stable epigenetic states that persist over the life of an individual or even that persist across generations? Well, there are a couple of instances of epigenetics persisting across generations, but they're still exceptional cases. Are they the tip of the iceberg or are they just little ice cubes? I don't know. We need to know. I and mean, there are the Dutch famines and other things that tell us that some things like that could happen, but how often is it the case? I think with epigenetic sequencing, we can find out. We can start looking and seeing how much, how, what, to what extent the epigenetic marks are preserved across generations. Now, there's no doubt that they can be preserved within an individual. Whether that's the mechanism by which there is a memory, like diabetes, early obesity, setting things, is it epigenetics? Is it that you build up a reserve of a certain cell type? I don't know. I want to be cautious also. I'm a huge believer in epigenetics. We do a lot of epigenetics. But I want to be cautious to say, what you want to know about is, how does environment leave a persistent mark on the organism? And one of those mechanisms could be methylation of DNA. One of those mechanisms could be sustained modifications of histones. But there could be other stable mechanisms. And the word epigenetics gets used for many things. In some people's minds, it's methylation. Some people's minds, it's protein. Some people's minds, it's any persistent state that sustains itself regardless of mechanism. And we have a lot to work out to figure out about how, how cells or tissues get into some kind of a, a stable loop. Epigenetics will certainly be a part of it. But we have to be very hard-headed about, about what the mechanisms are. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, yes. Yes. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> No, and the reason is, the reason is I don't think I have any data that could possibly tell. We know these cases of very strong selection that Party Sabeti has found, but... Um, yeah, but dog is under incredibly strong selection. You've got a lot of bottlenecks and a lot of selection. So the question is, how much of that is going on in human? Um, and I don't think we know and what signatures would we have. Right now, the, the nature of the bottlenecks we go through produce enough population differentiation that we don't have a good way to tell it from a selection short of these big sweeps. And we haven't looked at sweeps in small enough groups to know. So, um, so I'm going to say that even if I had an opinion, I wouldn't be entitled to it. So I'm going to not have an opinion. But it's a really good question. Yeah, well, and data, I think the answer to the question, as with many of these questions, are we have to get data. But the good news is it's not so hard to get data anymore. Anyway, thank you so much for the invitation to come. Great to be here.